Good morning. That was pretty good. Good morning. Okay. Scripture reading this morning is John 8 through 12 and 30 through 36. Once again, Jesus spoke to the people and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. As Jesus spoke these things, many believed in him. So he said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are Abraham's descendants, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say we will be set free? Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So be it. my own? Okay. Bow in prayer with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we have freedom to come and worship you today, Lord. Lord, as we think about the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, may we realize that we are a new creation, that we have been set free from the burden of sin and shame, that we are not only freed from the penalty of death, but we are freed to live a life that brings glory and honor to God. Help us not get caught up and distracted by the ways of the world, but to be a light in this world. Not a light that, that reflects even, but a light that emanates because Christ is, is living through us, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for this church. And with Lord, we pray a special uh, blessing upon Polly and Merle as they're with us in spirit, but not in body in the next upcoming months, Lord. And Lord, just help us to open our eyes and ears to hear your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I entitled this Captivity or Freedom. Thought about calling it darkness or light, or maybe death or life, right? Those are two op- each of those are two opposite things, captivity or freedom. So if you think about being set free, the opposite of that is are you still captive, right? If you think about darkness, the opposite of that is light, right? And if you think about death, the opposite is, of that is life. If you read your teachings this week, you read through Amos, you started Ezekiel and read chapters 1 through 10, and you read John chapter 7 through 10, verse 23. And Jesus had several things to say in John about who he was. I am. We're going to cover some of those things today. But first we'll talk a little bit about Amos. Amos 1, verse 1. These are the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders of Tekoa. What what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake in the days of when Uzziah the king of Judah and Jeroboam son of Je- Joash was king of Israel. We have this continued history that we need to learn from, from God's children, from his people. I like to say it sometimes or we can relate that to his church at that time. This is God's children that he called out of the darkness into the light and he did many wonderful deeds, showed, him that he was, showed them that he was God, that he could take care of them that he was leading them in the promised land, but yet they were a stiff-necked, rebellious people that would not put their faith and trust in God. They longingly looked for other things. The kingdom is a divided... Amos is warning the divided kingdom because the northern kingdom has fallen so far into idolatry. And as we get into Ezekiel, you'll see that Ezekiel, we've already gone to the time that the northern kingdom has fallen, and the southern kingdom has been part of them, have been taken to, um, into captivity. I want to read from Acts first and give you a little history, because Paul gives a history of this and talks about we've left the time of judges and moved forward several hundred years, but the pattern is still the same. People seem to do what's right in their own eyes, don't they? 
In Acts chapter 13, verse 16, Paul stood up, motioned with his hand, and began to speak. Men of, men of Israel and you Gentiles who fear God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made them into a great people during their stay in Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out of that land. He endured their conduct for about 40 years in the wilderness. And having vanquished seven nations, having vanquished seven nations in Canaan, he gave their land to his people as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave the judges until the time of Samuel the prophet, when the people asked for a king. And God gave them 40 years under Saul, son of Kish, from the tribe of Benjamin. After removing Saul, he raised up David as their king and testified about him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my will in its entirety. I think as I was reading this about our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come. I pray that every single day. Because if I don't, I tend to do my will and pursue my kingdom. Verse 23, From the descendants of this man God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as He promised. Before the arrival of Jesus, John preached a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his course, he said, Who do you suppose that I am? I am not the one, but He is coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, children of Abraham, and you Gentiles who fear God, it is, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their, and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, when, yet in condemning Him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read in every Sabbath. And though they found no ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have Him executed. When they carried out all, of, all that has, was written about Him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he has been seen by those who had accompanied him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now witnesses to our people. And now we proclaim to you the good news, what God promised our fathers. He has fulfilled for us their children by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm, You are my son today, I have become your father. And in fact, God raised him from the dead, never to see decay. As he, said, as he has said, I will, give you, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So also he says in another psalm, You will not let your holy one see decay. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. His body was buried with his fathers and saw decay. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore let it be known to you, brothers, that through Jesus the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. Through Him, everyone who believes is justified from everything. You could not be justified from the, from the, by the law of Moses. Watch out then that what has been spoken by the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am doing a great work in your days that you would never believe even if someone told you. Now I read you that so you can see the history because we read it in Amos and we read it in Ezekiel. The continued history of God's people continuing to not repent and turn from their sins. And the promise of salvation through Jesus Christ being out in front of them. You know the promise. His name is Jesus. How much more should you be living a life that brings glory and honor to God. Your body is a temple. How much more should you honor God with that temple? We look at the lessons of Israel, and we skip past them and everything, but they were a stiff-necked, rebellious people that God was still faithful. He did not stomp them out because of who He is. Now, those promises, if God was kept all of those promises for all of those years... How much more is the promise that you have of eternal salvation through Jesus Christ? How much more is that important is the message that you have to tell today? Today is the day of your salvation. The end of Acts chapter 13 says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That's why the church was birthed like it was birthed, because they were full of joy. They rejoiced all of the time, even in suffering. 
And they were full of the Holy Spirit that brought them comfort, that brought them peace, that transformed them into being like Christ in this world. Are you living that way? Because nothing has changed. We live in Babylon today. We live in a foreign world today. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Do you realize that or are you just living in the land going about your business? Back to Amos. We've gone forward from the time of Judges. That's why I read that. Like I said, we're in the divided kingdom in 150 years or so since the death of Solomon. Jeroboam II is, is the king, and he is successful in the eyes of the world because he's a great military campaign, and the people are doing good. And when they do good, they get fat and content and happy and start worshiping idols. Hmm. But Scripture tells us as you're reading Amos, what they do is they neglect the poor and they neglect justice, don't they? How much do we live for the almighty dollar today and prosperity in our life? And that is toned as being successful. And yet, there are plenty of people still in this world starving and hungry and miserable, needing the hope that only Jesus Christ can offer, and you're His ambassador, you're His witness. Chapters 1 and 2, Amos uh, protests against all the nations in the coming judgment. Chapter 3 to 6, he turns to Israel. God's children, so that they'll live differently in this world, so that they will bring light to the world. But they worship Him with only their lips, not with their hearts. They worship in hypocrisy. And chapter 5 begins with a lament and then a call for repentance. And in, that, in chapter 5 you read this in verse 4, For this is what the Lord says to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. That saving faith fixing your eyes on Jesus. And it says also in verse 14, seek good, not evil, so that you may live. That's not a contradiction. That's to seek God, and if you seek God, you will know God because God is love. If you seek God, how can you not love your brother? If you know Jesus Christ, how can you not lay down your life to save a friend? So if you're not doing this, do you really know Jesus? Are you really in a right relationship with God? Or do you need to repent and turn from your idols and turn to Him and let it be known by putting your faith into action, as, G as James says, proof that you are who you say you are. But Israel would not listen, and they were conquered by the Assyrians. Chapter 7 through 9 contains visions of the coming wrath against all idolatrous worship because God is a jealous God and He longs for you just as a husband and wife don't want any prom promiscuity in their relationship or anything. They want each other intimately. There's still hope. The book closes with hope that the day of the Lord is coming. Not the day of His wrath but the day that, of salvation. And we again know that that is Jesus Christ. We have such a wonderful story to tell, an amazing to story to tell. I'll remind you again what Paul wrote in the end of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. I told you I'd read it for several re weeks. Verse 18 in chapter 5, All this from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us, what? The ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting man's trespasses against them, and He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's fellow workers, then, we urge you to not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of favor I heard you, in the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the time of favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no one can discredit our ministry. That ministry of serving others because you yourself have humbled yourselves and laid down your life to follow after Jesus to be like Him in this world in what you say and what you do. Paul wrote these words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Now about the times and seasons, brothers, we do not need to write you, for you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying peace and security, destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains of a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. 
But you, brothers, are not in the darkness, so that this day should not overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We not, do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us remain awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of our hope of salvation. The faith that we have in God so that we love Him and we love others and the hope that we have that points eternally to God. Oh, I made a picture of a cross, didn't I? Is that the hope that you have and is that how you live? Second Peter 3, Peter writes this, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and its works will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Do you get the point? Are we learning from Israel's past or are we doing the same things again? It does take time as you read through the, these Old Testament scriptures to apply them to Jesus and see the goodness of God, His love, His mercy and grace, how great your salvation is and not make the same mistakes that they made. Because you got to admit to yourself if you're honest, if you sit down, you know that you do some of the same things with your life. Whether it's complacency or sins in your life or whatever it is or just a lack of faith. But Jesus said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And that's what He's called us to do. So we've started reading Ezekiel. The northern kingdom has gone. They would not repent. Wouldn't you think they would learn from their brothers and sisters? But no, they went down the exact same path. They would not listen. They would not heed. And part of the people have been taken off to captivity. And that's where we begin with Ezekiel. He should have been taken into the priesthood and still he sees his visions and everything and he, t he tells uh, Judah that they need to repent. Ezekiel chapter 1 starts this way. In the thirteenth year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was among the exiles by the river Kabar, the heavens opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. The word of the Lord came directly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buza, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar. And there the Lord's hand was upon him. I looked and I saw. Now don't get caught up in what everything means in the vision. We see a vision kind of like we see in Revelation and stuff. We see God's glory to make it simple. And God's glory is there with Israel, but God's glory leaves the temple which they put their faith and trust in this temple again. They think there's no way that God will, will ever leave His temple in Israel, but God's glory is where His people are, the ones that truly believe, the ones where His children are. Isn't that where God should be, is with His children, even if they're in captivity? That's where I hope He would be. If I'm in captivity, I hope He would be with me. And I know that Jesus said that He would never forsake me. He, I would never be alone. That's why He would said, tell the Father to send the Spirit to be with me, to comfort me so that I could comfort others, as we read in Corinthians. So that I would continue to have hope. So that I could, could live as I ought to live as a child of light, even in captivity. Ezekiel's strange as we read it. He had to lay on his side and eat food cooked over poop for over a year. If they won't listen to my words, and let me give actions out here. Certainly they'll listen to me if I have to lay on the ground and eat cook, food cooked over poop. Certainly someone will hear me. But we go about our way and say, well, that guy's just, <laughs> he's, he's nuts. What about the message? Was his message truth? We can compare it to God's word. That's what we're told to do. In Awanas, we're told to what? To study. Study diligently God's word so we can be approved workmen because we are workers for Jesus Christ. A workman that does not need to be ashamed because he knows how to rightly handle the word of truth because we read and study God's word and apply it to our lives so that we're not the same. So that we do go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth and we train up disciples to obey all of Jesus' commands. 
So as you're reading through John, look at what those commands are and compare and see how you're doing. And look at who he says he is because you are that in Christ. You give the bread of life. You are light to the world. You are sheep that follow a shepherd. You know the way, the truth, and the life. So are you leading other people into the fold? Israel thought they would be safe because of a temple. They didn't understand when Jesus said to tear down this temple, that's a sign he would give them and he, and he would rebuild it in three days again because he was talking about his body, not this monument temple that we've built and think God's glory is there. This church is a building. We come in here to worship, but we can go anywhere we want to and worship where two or three are gathered together. And God is with us and God hears us. Even if we're in captivity... God's temple is where His true children are. Anywhere, everywhere, even in captivity. John chapter 2, verse 17 to 21. This is after the first sign, and I'm re reminding you of this so that you pick up some of these things as we cover a little bit of John in a minute that we read. This is after Jesus turned water into wine. Okay? Okay. And you think about all that and you think about Jesus being living water, but you think also about wine and celebration and it being good wine. And there's a celebration here. That's His first miracle to happen because we have something to celebrate, living water that He offers the woman at the well. And it's a joyous celebration with the best wine ever and it's not going to run out. This is what we have to tell others. This is our salvation that we're working out. And just after that, He clears the temple because of the money changing that's going on there. Because the love of money is the root of all evil, isn't it? And we think that we can't live without money. We put our faith and trust in money, the things that it can provide us. Because how are we even going to buy food if we don't have money? Doesn't God know we need food? Won't He supply it? Doesn't He supply it to the sparrows? Hmm. And it says in John chapter 2, verse 17, His disciples remember that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Do you have zeal for His house? We're not talking about this building again. We're talking about do you have zeal for His house where He lives? On account of this, the Jews demanded, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do these things? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. This temple took 46 years to build, the Jews replied, and you're going to raise it up in three days. But Jesus was speaking about the temple of His body. Back to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you, whom you have revealed, received from God? You are not your own. You were bought by a price. Therefore, God glorify God with your body. So we left off last week in John chapter 6. It ended this way, verses 67 to 70. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you want to leave too? Because all the people had gathered together, crowds beyond belief, and Jesus fed 5,000 men, which is probably 13,000 individuals, give or take. And He tested them, to see His disciples, to see what they would do because He asked them to feed the people, remember? Because He wants you to feed the people. And the only way you're going to be able to feed the people is to eat the bread of life, Jesus Christ. So are you eating the bread of life? Are you devouring His Word? Is it nourishing you? Are you growing from it? Are you offering it to others as you go about? But they, people did not want a Savior like this. And even many of the disciples turned away that day. So Jesus asked in verse 67 to the twelve, Do you want to leave also? But Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. So if you don't accept Jesus and don't eat the bread of life, you will not have eternal life, will you? I asked you before, what's the opposite of darkness? Light. You should be light. What's the opposite of death? Life. What's the opposite of captivity? Freedom. Because he who is set free is free indeed to live like Jesus in this world with no condemnation whatsoever so that you can live totally different. Because before in the Old Testament you had a hope of this and you lived for the hope, but now you know the reality because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. 
And you know that if God would give His only begotten Son, that surely Jesus will keep His promise in return for you one day. But we will all give account, won't we? Verse 69, We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God, the one that was promised. And Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you? It's not by any works of righteousness you've done. It's because Jesus Christ chose you. God chose you. Jesus died for you and chose you to be God's child and an ambassador for Him to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Because what He started doing here, He left with you. He gave you all authority and power to do the same works in this world as He was doing. Nothing has changed 2,000 years later. In fact, there's more urgency because we're closer to the day that He returns, correct? So i got to ask, has Jesus chosen you? I mean, that's where we're at. Because if we're not, you're still captive. You're still living in darkness. There is no life. So we read this week John chapter 7 through John chapter 10, verse 23. John chapter 7 starts this way. After, after this, Jesus traveled through Galilee. He did not want to travel in Judea because the Jews there were trying to kill him. However, the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near. And here's where you need to study so you know what that feast is about and stuff. And I don't have the time to devote to it that I would love to because there's so much we're going to cover. But the Feast of Tabernacles was near. Tabernacles is a dwelling place. They realized that God took care of them in the wilderness and they longed for the eternal tabernacling with God. Okay? So Jesus' brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you're doing because people have taken up the mantle to follow after Jesus and be His disciple and be like Him, to learn from the Master so that they can teach others. And this Feast of Tabernacles is one of the three feasts that all Jewish men are required to go to. And they have a joy about going to it. Verse 4, For no one wants to be known publicly, who wants to be known publicly acts in secret. They don't get it again. <laughs> they don't understand that Jesus is going to humble Himself and lay down His life. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. That's why we would yell to him when he's on the cross, come down off there if you're really the Son of God, when he says, I can't come off here, this cross, because I love you too much. Verse 5, For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, Although your time is always at hand, my time has not yet come. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. They haven't truly seen the light yet at this point. They haven't come out of the light. They're still living in some darkness. They believe, but they haven't understood who Jesus really is yet. We get down to verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast. Again, you've got to understand some of that again. But the point of it, I love when so many people say, Well, Jesus was so meek and everything. Jesus was very, very powerful. He was meek when he wanted to be meek. And he had all authority and power when he needed to have it. Standing up at the pinnacle of the festival, he cried up, cried with a loud voice and said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Okay, the festival lasted for seven days, I believe. I don't have notes in front of me of this and everything. And the priest would bring living water out of the, or water out of the pool and pour it upon the altar. Okay? All this symbolism of, of, of salvation and faith in God and everything. And on the last day... They, another priest would join with the wine water and wine okay and they would circle around the throne and get ready to pour the water out and right as they were getting ready to pour the water out and there was a silence over all the people Jesus stood up and said if anyone is thirsty come to me wow don't you know that you could have heard a pin drop then come to me so I got to think again, am I thirsty? Do I really thirst? Do I even know what thirsting is? I've been what I call thirsty when I've gone on a long hike and forgot to take water with me and the sun beating down. But that's not thirsting. It's, it's being, having a desire to drink. Thirsting is when your mouth's so parched and everything that water hits it and it burns even. But you need that water to nourish because if you don't nourish it, you're going to die. Do you realize without Jesus Christ that you will die in your trespasses and sin? Do you long for that living water? And if you do, let's read on and see what it says. 
Whoever believes in me, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. So not only will I be quenched, but I will be a source to pour water to others. Not physical water, but spiritual water that will save them for all eternity. Verse 39, he was speaking about the Spirit. So I've got to walk with the Spirit. I've got to be led to the Spirit. I've got to listen to the Spirit and tune with the Spirit every single day. I have to be thirsty and I have to drink, drink, drink so that I can offer others drink. John chapter 8. Once again, Jesus spoke to the people and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. Are you captive or are you free? Are you living in the darkness or are you living in light? Are you still dead in your trespasses and sin or do you have life? So if you're to give water and you will have the light of light, you're supposed to walk around showing your light. You know, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? Go out any night, especially somewhere up on the mountain or whatever, and look at the stars. You know, they reflect God's glory. It's a word I'm going to use. Jesus shines in and through you. Big difference. They will, they will fade away. You will live eternally with God if you have the light of Jesus Christ in you. And if you do, then you've got to be a light to the world. The religious refuse to believe. They refuse to come to the light because why? Jesus already said it in Nicodemus. Because your deeds are evil and you don't want to be exposed. You love money more than you love God. You don't have enough faith, whatever the reasons are. Verse 23, then he told them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. That is why I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. But there were people that believed. There were people that came out of the darkness into the light. And I love reading through John because at the end you see Nicodemus finally figured it out. <laughs> he finally quit holding on to those other things but threw away everything that tangled him up. Verse 30, As Jesus spoke these things, many believed in Him. So He said to the Jews who had believed in Him, If you continue in My word, you are truly My disciples. Because there might be a time where you've drank in a time where you receive light but if you don't continue and I'm not getting into we're losing your salvation or anything I'm just reading scripture here proof is in the pudding again if you continue your faith was genuine and the good thing about salvation as long as you can turn and repent and God listens to you then you can be saved at any point however far you get off the path wherever you are in your life all you've got to do is turn before it's too late before captivity and darkness engulf you unless you believe that I am he you will die in your sins as Jesus spoke these things many believed in him so he said to the Jews who had believed in him if you continue in my word you are truly my disciples then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You don't have to worry about any of the things of this world. You won't be attracted to the things that you used to be attracted to. You want to live for Jesus because He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. You want to praise God for who He is, the mercy that He has given you, the grace that He's bestowed upon you, who He is, and it will change who you are. You won't just be a Jesus freak. You'll be someone who understands what it's truly like to be free and not tied down by the things of this world. And you'll be building treasures in heaven where they're trying to store up treasures here on earth that will be destroyed. 
Yet the religious of that day still thought they were God's children because they held on to their ancestry, who they are, that they went to church, that they did this, they grew up in a Christian home. I'm talking about us more today, but they held on to who they were in Abraham. Verse 39, it said, Abraham is our father. But Jesus answered, if you were children of Abraham, then you would do the works of Abraham. There's the proof in the pudding again. Are you living like Christ in this world? If you're not, why? Why are you not? I don't have enough time. I don't have the ability. I don't have whatever it is. Really? <laughs> Increase our faith, Lord. Verse 40, but now you're trying to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I, that I heard from God, Abraham never did such a thing. You are doing the works of your father, which would be the devil. Verse 51, truly, truly, I tell you, if anyone keeps my words, he will never see death. Free or captive, light or darkness, life or death. If you believe in Jesus, it changes everything. Abraham saw the light even without the promise fulfilled. You and I have seen the promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So are we rejoicing? Are we happy? Or many times as Christians are we like this? Or better yet, like this? Or are we rejoicing and people seeing that, that love that we have, that even in adversity, the peace that we have, that they see the genuineness that we walk the walk, not just talk the talk? So if you're a child of Abraham, then you live a life of faith. He was willing to sacrifice his son because he knew that God could raise him from the dead, Scripture says. I don't have Abraham's faith yet. You might, I don't. But increase my faith, Lord. Remind you in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, this is after we talked about Abraham and Noah and those others. In verse 39 it says, These were all commended for their faith, yet they did not receive what was promised. God had planned something better for us so that together with us they would be, be, would be made perfect. Have you ever thought about it? Something better for us. They lived by faith that they had to profess in God without the reality of Jesus Christ. You have the reality of Jesus Christ that you can profess a faith to the world that God loved you so much that He gave His one and only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. So are you living the example so that you can proclaim the words? Oh, let's read on. Therefore, since we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run this race with endurance, the race set out before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for the joy, there's that joy again like Abraham had, set before him, he endured the cross, whatever that cross might be for you, because you've denied yourself and you're following Jesus. Scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How much do you think about the heavenly home that you have, the future that you have, so that you think more and fix more on heavenly living rather than on earthly living? This is not your home. You are an ambassador here in a foreign land. Israel made it their home. They made Babylon their home, whatever it was where the foreign gods were and didn't take them and get them out of their homes and intermarried with their children and it led them into captivity and death instead of freedom because they didn't see the light and didn't shine like lights in this world. So then we get to John chapter 9. Verse 4, While it is daytime, we must do works of Him who sent me. While it's light. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the, wor in the world, I am the light of the world. If Jesus is the light in the world and we're supposed to be like light, then that makes us like dim bulbs in the world, right? 
No, it makes us like bright lights, which if you take a flame again, because that's their lights, they didn't have iridescent light bulbs. And you take a flame and you put another flame together with it, what happens? It increases in intensity, in brightness. So if you and I come together, our light will shine even more. Because how could all of these people get along and love each other and have love for others? Verse 25 of John chapter 9. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I don't know. There is one thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. You know the story. You read it, right? You know the blind man born from birth, and his parents don't, don't want to get involved either because they don't know, but the blind man just knows this. He can now see. He was blind from birth. That means he had never experienced light. None whatsoever. So when he first had his eyes open, he saw light to the point where he couldn't probably see or whatever else, and then saw Jesus. Have you seen the light and saw Jesus in the light? The one who gave his life for you? You can't help but tell him. You don't need to know the story. You just know you were blind, and now you see. This is the man's testimony. Because the Pharisees accuse him of being a, a demon possessed and not from God. The one thing I do know, I do know this. I was blind and now I see. There's the testimony. You don't need fancy words, anything else. You need to say, I just, I, whatever your testimony is. What did he do to you, they asked, verse 26. How did he open your eyes? You don't need to know how all that is. He replied, I already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? The man even knew that, the, that seeing Jesus meant I've got to believe for who he is, the mighty signs, at least I believe because of that. And then I become a disciple to learn and to follow after Jesus to train up others and tell them about it because it's so great. I was blind, but now I see. Why would I not want to tell the world? So with joy... <laughs> He accepted Jesus. Verse 39, Jesus declared, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind may see, and those who see may become, may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this, and they asked him, Are we blind too? He said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but since you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Boy, that is sobering. You better realize whether you're blind or not. John chapter 10, verse 2, But the one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by a name and leads them out. Again, you need to learn, you need to study and learn some of the context. There was two ways that sheep were kept in olden days. We don't know it as much now, so we don't know about kings and kingdoms as much. So we have to think of these things and realize these things. In that day, a shepherd went out. He might have had a helper or whatever. And he took his, his sheep out to pasture, led them to water and everything. You know, Psalm 23. He was the one out there with him. He fought off the wild animals. He had his staff and he had his rod. The rod would, would be for protection and the staff was a walking staff and he could also grab the sheep and whatever. Oh, and he would go find that one lost sheep, wouldn't he? You know that story too. But he was out there and at night he would find a place for them and he would sit down and become the gate for them, so to speak, wherever he put them so that any wild animal would have to come through him first because he protected his sheep. He laid down his life for his sheep. They were his sheep. They weren't for food. They were primarily for wool that would keep them warm and, and other things, provide them money, whatever. But when they went into the town, there was a communal sheep area. So they were mixed in with other sheep. Kind of like that sheep and goat thing, maybe even, but oh, that's different. But there were other sheep that weren't my sheep as a shepherd. So I go up to the sheep pen. I'm looking around. I don't go grab each of them. I just simply say, come on. And they hear my voice and they follow. And they won't come out for anyone else because they don't know their voice. They will stay in the pen. So you got that context? So Jesus said, I am the shepherd of the sheep and they listen to my voice. 
No one else's. Verse 7, So he said to them again, Truly, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. So we've taken this analogy that we know and understand. We don't know it so much, but they understood it. And they see that they're safe, secure. And when he leads me out, he's going to take me to pasture and water. He's going to take care of all my needs. What am I worried about? If Jesus is the gate, I'm safe. If I come out through him and he leads me, I've got everything I need. Why do I worry what, like the rest of the world worries about, about what I'm going to eat and what I'm going to wear? Why instead don't I do things for the kingdom? Why don't I live for God in faith that He's going to supply me and everything? I didn't say not work or do anything like that. But know that God is going to take care of you so that I'm not working for the almighty dollar or whatever it is. He will come in and go out and find pasture. You will go about your daily activities in the life of a sheep. Wherever you're at, wherever the pastures are, wherever, whatever pen you're at in whatever city, you will go in and go out and find pasture. You will do the things that sheep do as you listen to the voice of the shepherd. So if you're thirsty, you've got to drink. Let's go back to six. If chapter six, if you if you're hungry, you got to eat. You've got to nourish yourself so you can grow and live. You've got to drink, especially if you're going to live, and then give that food and drink to others. And you are a light in this world if you're offering them spiritual food and water. But if you're not listening to the sheep, to the shepherd doing the things that sheep should do, are you going in and going out and finding pasture? Or are you refusing to say, no, I'm staying in here because it's better. There's a grain bowl right over here. Or I'm going out, no, I don't want to go back in there because it's nicer over here in this field. Or are you listening to the shepherd? In and out every day, finding pasture for your soul and telling others. Do you see the things that Jesus is saying? Are you following him? Is he each of these things to you? Because he is. He says, I am. Before Abraham, I am. He always will be. And he's called you by name to be like him in this world. Because it said, because if you read on, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in as well. And they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. Do you understand that? Kim, if you didn't text Sherry, you might want to. <laughs> didn't think about it. Your purpose is to go out with Jesus and bring other sheep in. I don't know how Jesus can put it more clearly. If you're not reading and not studying, you might just pass by it and think this is just some story about sheep and farming. But it's about you following the voice of Jesus and Him taking care of every need that you have, loving you, calling you by name so that you can go out and about and find pasture and bring the rest of the sheep in until the day when Jesus Christ returns. I hope you think that as you read through John because there's so much more in the book of John. I'm thinking about maybe just preaching on it next year. I don't know. Taking a gospel. But there's so much there that Jesus said. And when you study and see how, how he professed the message that he said at the height of the uh, celebrations and everything, the whole world was buzzing about who this was. Who could Jesus be? And there's still the same world way today. Listen to songs, read in blogs. Jesus is mentioned all over the place, but he's misunderstood because he's accepted as a good teacher. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. The thing is, is he king of, in, of your life so that people see him in you? Because if not, he's going to continue just to be a good 
teacher or whatever to the world unless you profess and live like Jesus in this world. And we will be held accountable for every thought, every action. And again, why could we not, if God loves us this much, how can we not be a child of light and a child of love, feeding and nourishing others? Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that I, my sins and everyone who believes have been, have been totally justified, that we are set free for the penalty of death. But Lord, as your children, help us to not be complacent and help us to realize that we're free to live a life that brings glory and honor to you, that we're not tired down by the things of this world, but we're free to be, even suffer, Lord, but to be different. I just thank you and praise you and ask for your increase of faith to be more like Jesus, for the empowering of the Spirit, that you that as I read God's Word and as each one here reads, reads your Word, O oh Lord, that, that the Spirit reveals all truth to us so that the truth will truly set us free. I just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Harry, can we gather around and say a prayer for you guys for safe travel? Come on up.